folks, welcome back to the My Tech Decisions podcast. It has been about a, a little bit over a year since the critical vulnerability in LogBridge Area was discovered, and it took its hackers no time at all to add the exploit to their toolkits. Despite a renewed emphasis on securing the software supply chain and open source software, cybersecurity experts say the vulnerability will persist for many years to come. In short, IT professionals and system administrators should remain vid- vigilant, says Bob Rudis, the vice president of data science for cybersecurity from Gray Noise, today's podcast guest. Before we get to Bob, here's a quick reminder to check out the podcast on iTunes, Google, and Spotify to hear from IT professionals about how to make the right technology decisions for your organization. And now here's Bob. All right, so we are talking about the uh, Gray Noise 2022 Mass Exploitation, exploitation Report. Um, right off the bat, um, are there any you know uh, key findings you want you want to talk about, or anything um, that really jumped out to you um, when looking at the report? Yeah. So the the what I really liked about the report is um, having done other larger reports before. We wanted to be really focused, give it something that folks could actually read. And we asked the research team, say, hey, you know, you had to deal with all these this past year. <laughs> so like what in your mind were the things that we had to actually scramble or f- put a lot of focus into or there were a lot of follow ups to in terms of the amount of exploitation going on or just the complexity or whatever it was. Um, and that also were meaningful to defenders because there's, as you know, like you, you cover tech all the time, right? So there's lots of there's just lots of garbage in tech and lots of garbage in cyber, right? And there's things people make a big deal out of that aren't actually a really big deal. Um, and what we care about most is like helping and like me and me in particular, but the team too, to help everybody like save time, go do real work, not worry about the stuff if you don't have to. Um, so we asked them to say, what should we write about from that perspective? And this is what they came back with. So we we really didn't have an overarching thing on top of that, but like, what can we do to communicate and save time? And I found it really interesting, uh, the ones that they focused on, because in if I had been picking it, I'm not sure I would have honed in on those ones, not because they're wrong on those things. I just probably had a different perspective on it. But the 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 four the four we really cover, like one was Log4j, and like we don't have to talk about Log4j because like if someone doesn't know what Log4j is, by <laughs> I don't know if any conversation we're having is going to change their minds or help inform them. But yeah, the big thing there was like you know, and what's my own maybe my only prediction for this year is like Log4j is going to bite a bunch a bunch of people this year without mm-hmm. them realizing it because it's just so pervasive it's going to pop back up and what and and all, and all that. Uh, I really liked uh, with one of them who focused on the Atlassian Confluence server vulnerability, um, just because, and the, and I know this is no shocker to anybody, and I used to actually scan the internet for a living, so like I, I do know that this is out there, but you know that's a very like outwardly facing service that I initially, when I first started scanning like years ago, was surprised that I'm not surprised at anything anymore, and I'm not surprised that there were so many Confluence servers, and it's a really high value target for attackers, and they I think putting that color on there and helping folks understand why attackers like really honed in on that one and went there because it's like the knowledge base for every organization like i mean for better or for worse everyone uses atlassian stuff i don't i don't care what anybody's opinion is like it's just out there and, and it does that and and they store for better or for worse secrets of some kind in there even credentials but even like you know sensitive urls or other there are even like api keys and that's just a great source of info and like i think the really sneaky one about that that i believe they mentioned in there too is that you know people might the attackers might go after those servers not even like ransomware them but just kind of sneak on them poke around for a while and leave and maybe keep access to it but you know they'll just use that information without you knowing they were ever there so it's kind of insidious uh the one and this is one that really caught me by surprise for for the one researcher that that that, that put this in there and all the all their names are credited in there so i'm not going to go through names in here because I'll, I'll i'll just destroy some names too so i don't okay. want to do that to them um but the uh you know i never think of like a web server anymore as like a vulnerable like i saw i know they're vulnerable but like they're just like nginx is pervasive apache is pervasive these things are pervasive and yeah they've got bugs and there's versions out there like you know they're old like really old versions um, but you know the but I, I believe this was Brianna that that this one's like at least their first name and they they were saying like hey you know Apache is this core thing in so many technologies and this bug was really bad I believe this was the directory traversal one and like this was this was again something that we saw on our side you know like looking at what the attackers were doing they were going after it it didn't stop like we actually saw it happen throughout the whole year like because a lot of times what'll happen is we'll see a big flare up. 
and then everything kind of goes away. And like Log4j didn't go away, Confluence didn't go away, Apache didn't go away. And I guess the other one, which is F5, um, F5s are really great targets because they front a whole bunch of things and it's actually a piece of security technology. And whenever there is a bug, and it's not that frequent that they have bugs, but whenever there is one, um, that's a really big target for those. And that's another one where if it, we, you know, we saw it, we had stuff ready for it. We saw the attackers doing work you know, against it. And then they just never stopped going there. So that's kind of the focus for the whole report is like, hey, this is kind of what the attackers motive, like mo modus operandi is for these kind of high value targets. And this is why they're high value targets. And then, and then I think finally, and this was more me being kind of like a meta blatherer in the whole report. Um, but like, I, I really love CIS's new known exploited vulnerabilities catalog um, that, you know, that came out like literally right before Log4j. And like, it's just, a, I find it to be a great resource for depend vendors, even though we beat them 60% of the time on getting stuff up before they do. It does a little, little humble brag, but like they, they, they do good work too. Um, and you know, just seeing the amount of triage that had to occur for that year, for the year of 2022, with just the Kev entries, so we, we call them Kev, it's because it's shorthand, um, for just the Kev entries alone, um, you know, I used to have to defend networks and systems and organizations. And like, I, I, rem I mean, like, it's like, it's not PTSD, but like, I have flashbacks of like how much of a hurry up exercise it was and the stress and everything they have to go through. So we just wanted to paint a picture for folks is like, yeah, this is what you have to go through. You need to resource appropriately for this. This is what you need to be watching for. Um, so we kind of just, that was the really whole focus of the thing. It's like, hey, organizations, this is what your teams are going through. Teams, we feel you, we, we grok you. We know this, we're trying to help you by giving this information to people that are reading it. And we're hoping that people kind of use that to, you know, see how they might change the way they address vulnerabilities moving forward. But yeah, I think we're going to see just another kind of a brutal year for, for everybody out there. Yeah, um, and that's um, pretty much on par with what, you know, uh, other, you know, uh, cybersecurity experts have been saying um, in terms of, I mean, just look at, you know, the first patch Tuesday, there are almost 100 vulnerabilities. So here we yeah. go, you know, here we go again. Yep. Um, so the report talks um, at length about uh, Log4j. Yep. Um, well, why does that one specifically get so much attention? Yeah, so I think one so one reason why we did it is uh, we uh, so I wasn't at Gray Noise when like they jumped into the log for J Frey. Like I was at Rapid Seven at the time, and we were actually working closely, not really closely, but we were trading data back and forth and trading JNDI strings and regular expressions. It was just it was a very fun time in in scare quotes, yeah. right? And um, so there was a lot of attention drawn to all the work that the Gray Noise uh, researchers and their engineers and everybody was doing around there. And we tried to like throughout the year, maybe like, hey, Log4j is still a thing. This is what we're seeing. Hey, Log4j is still a thing. And, you know, there's the tendency at the beginning of the year to forget the old, like, ring in the new and kind of not look back. And we just wanted to make folks aware. And I was really like, um, if if people hit, don't go to my Twitter, but if, if you are dangerous and careless enough to go to my Twitter, a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, I actually like, I, I, I added a bunch of other, um, other researchers out there who are also noting the fact that like Log4j is going to be a bad thing this year. And like all of our gut instincts and all the, and we, and it's not just gut instincts. It's also the, we see the regular attempts at log4j even till today yeah. right yeah. and so there the attackers are basically they've incorporated into so the entire mirai botnet can be at at, a, at the drop of a dime anyone can rent a space on it and click log4j and it goes out and tries to find like any new log4j that's out there it's so easy and it's so simple yeah. and we're, so our biggest concern is like you know organizations they're they're large they're complex entities someone says i need to restore this server from backup and it's the backup that happened in November of the right just before Log4j happened. Now that things on the internet or even internal, and, and you've got that problem. So we wanted to really focus on we're still seeing it. It's still a problem. We don't want anyone to get hurt with this. Please don't take your eye off the ball on this one and keep rerunning your Log4j scans and keep caring about this and keep raising concerns in your organization mm -hmm. for this. Yeah. How often should you be scanning your systems for log, vulnerable Log4j instances? Yeah, that's actually a really interesting question. Um, and it's like what I will so I will answer it, but I'm also going to suggest that you hit up folks at Rapid Seven for that one too, because that's like that's their bailiwick. Like they like their scanning is like what they do. Uh it really so depends on the enterprise, but at a minimum, so I can at least do that for for you. Um I if I I if I were back at a mid-size org or if I was back at where I used to work at large organizations, minimum once a month, we would be doing a perimeter scan for minimum for, for log4j. Uh it's hard to do scans at large organizations. It's 
hard day, not less sorry, less hard ish at medium sized ones. Um, small ones, if they have the resources, can do it more frequently, but they require someone that knows what they're doing for those. Um, but if you're not at least looking at it monthly, you're missing something. And I, honestly, if you could do it daily, um, and this is what this is what I was saying back at Rapid, and I believe they were uh, the folks at, at Gray Noise early on were doing too. If you can, and if it's not an intrusion and you're not going to break anything, like maybe have the log for j scanner run daily if you can. I mean, if, if you can get it to a science and you're not going to break anything, just run it because if you can get there before the attacker does, you've just scored a win for your organization versus you have to actually respond to a cleanup in your organization. And that's the last thing we want folks to have to go through. In what ways have we seen it, you know, weaponized among threat actors in the last, uh, you know, year and a couple of weeks now, I guess? Yeah, so I mean, some of, there were some bigger ones where I mean, in which it's kind of the sad thing, right? Like, so the 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 way that most vulnerabilities these days get weaponized is that cool word ransomware, that terrible, evil, yeah. cool, awful word ransomware. Uh, there were some major ransomware attacks um, against uh, fi financial organizations uh, throughout the, throughout the year last year. I think four or five made it into like some major IT and cyber headlines. If folks, if you go look at, it, you'll see that out there. Um, what I what I found interesting though is some of the ones earlier on, and I don't know how this is going to be a thing this year, just because of the chaos and the the whole like digital currency space. Like it's just kind of been a really weird start to the year for digital currency. Um, and they were hit hard with like, hey, we're going to go in there and we're going to actually like not just ransomware you, but maybe just take you down and take your currency and kind of go do things. So, like my some my so that's the so the game they going after those organizations is somewhat easy because it's complex infrastructure. There's lots of stuff that's out there. Folks have to like they're juggling a lot of things out there um, and that's where some of the, those big things are the problem is is like there were a lot of other so if you were to just have a casual conversation with any given decent sized cyber insurer and you you got enough whatever their flavor of alcoholic beverages inside them and maybe got two or three of them they they might let loose that oh yeah we had log for j claims last year you're never going to see like an actual full-on enterprise that didn't get taken out with ransomware be in the news with a news item because they're better than that. Like they have good control over their comms and they can do things like that. Um, but there were more organizations that get hit with log for j than will ever make the media. Um, it just requires a little bit of like careless talk and loose lips from certain people to, to kind of tell you that. Um, so I think almost every industry was hit with that last year. I, I, I don't think a single one escaped that. Um, and what's interesting now, um, so we're seeing those scans still happen. And separately from that, like I, as just an individual, casual, personal researcher, um, like use the folks over at Canary Tokens, like I have Canary, my own Canary Tokens separate from the gray noise infrastructure, but front from those folks. And I'm seeing almost daily pings um, with those on random bits of infrastructure, not even our really cool honeypots, but just random nodes on the internet that I just happen to run for fun. Um, so if attackers are really that heck bent on trying to find these things, there's a good chance that they know something that we don't. Um, or are counting on the fact that folks are going to slip up and their infrastructure is going to either put new log4j badness out there or repost exist like old log4j badness out there. Yeah, can you talk about what you know IT professionals should be mindful of so they don't reintroduce you know vulnerable log4j instances in their environment? Yeah, I mean, like this is this is a really weird piece of advice that I'm about to give you. It's, everyone's gonna laugh and shake their heads or whatever. But like, delete your backups before November. I mean, like before before November yeah. for Log4J. And like, and I'm being a little bit like a little tongue in cheek, a little facetious with that. Um, but honestly, I if you could, if there was any way, and this is something that I don't know how, like the the sophistication level for what I'm about to say, maybe a little high. Like, it does require really good mature IT processes. And thankfully, like for there are some good things this year, right? Like there are more organizations with more mature IT processes than there ever have been before. So that's like a really good sign. And for those folks, you know, could they put in some alerting or stop automation if there's automation involved to say, oh, you're about to restore something before November of, the, of that year. Hey, maybe like you need to click another box to go. I have validated that this is not going to introduce a log4j vulnerability into our environment. I mean, it's literally something as simple as that check alone would be enough to save, I would guess, over half, maybe even more organizations from potentially reintroducing that into the environment. Um, if you could do that, as well as that scanning regimen that I talked as frequently as you can, you'll catch those log4j instances. Um, the scanners got really good after about six months, right? Um, it's sad that it took that long, but it did take that long to get some really good log4j scanners out there. Um, and between those two practices, like have some kind of hard stop at it or have a think twice before you, you, know, you know, do that patch um, of the backup reload from that long ago, and then also keep scanning. Um, I think those two practices, if you can do that with your organization, if you've got the IT practices involved that are that mature, you will be safer than a lot of organizations that are just 
kind of having to go do what they're doing, you know, and what doesn't help right now is there's this giant economic crunch. There's layoffs all across the board. Cybersecurity teams have been somewhat in the forefront of that layoff scheme in a lot of organizations and even some IT professionals have as well too, right? So there's fewer folks and fewer legacy folks and organizations that know where everything is and understand everything right. involved to do all these things. So I guess if that's the only gotcha for the year, it's like, hey, like maybe if you let go of a bunch of security people or the folks that knew how you do backups and restores, m- maybe bring those back if you can, because like <laughs> you're, you're, you're going to, you may, you may pay the price otherwise if, if you don't think twice about that. Yeah. Um, so CISA was maintaining like a, a very long list of products that were affected by by this bug. Um, what's the yeah. stats of that list, and and you know how many more products out there are still impacted by this? Yeah, that's, that's a my, th- thank you for depressing me with that question. Uh, <laughs> so I was so excited. Um, so like they so CISA initially worked with Kevin Beaumont, Gossy the dog, for people that just know Twitter yeah. handles, um, and a couple other folks out there because they were doing a great job, like like Yeoman's work trying to maintain and, and curate that list. And like they're not a multi billion dollar agency of the U.S. federal government, right? So like yeah, it's great you can like that they were trying, but like they are not resourced to do that. Kevin's awesome. But he's one person. He can't possibly do all that stuff on his own. So when I saw Sista saying, hey, we'll try this, I got like super excited because this is honestly one of the first times we've ever seen an effort like that to try to get ahead of the problem, work with vendors and see what's going on there. And the amount of pull requests that we saw like going into that originally and vendors jumping on board and like practitioners saying, oh, yeah, we asked who, you know, it was a, that crowdsourcing effort. Um, was like super exciting at the beginning of the year. Like I had like like I'm not I'm not a very hopeful person in cyber. I think everyone that knows me that's watching this probably is not shocked at that at that fact. Um, and I got really excited because wow, wait, we we could do this. Maybe we can like paradigm shift and change things over. Um, and then like everything else, right? Like priorities change. I despite everyone's like assumptions and everyone's like maybe like well, of course there are CIS is a multi billion dollar yeah CIS is like is a multi billion dollar agency and it has a broad directive across a number of things and the folks that deal with vulnerability management at CISA, I can I, I'm shrinking that it's a it's it's a core team a really smart capable strong core team, but they can only do so much and they rely on vendors to do the communication so there are around May, March or April, like maybe if I'm being kind, May of, of last year, the list just really stopped getting updated. Um, folks stopped reporting into there. And what's worse for me is like, I we know for a fact, new things with Log4j kept going introduced into the environment because it just is, that's how software works. And none of those are getting added to the list. So there are still thousands of unknowns and there are still thousands of, it's still vulnerable that, that are uh, pieces of software that are out there. My only saving grace is that most, the most, and like I'm I'm trying to believe that internally, but most aren't internet facing. It doesn't mean they're like really safe, but it means they're safe from all the traffic that we're seeing at least, which is which is a really good thing. So you're saying that some software vendors are still releasing products that are that have this bug? Yeah, so all you have to do, um, so Sonotype, thank, thank, thank you, Sonotype, is still maintaining their kind of dashboard for how many like downloads of the vulnerable versions of Log4j that there are. It kind of maintains steady state at about half for a very long time, and I haven't checked in like two months, but it's still not the number is not great. Like it's not, it's let's put it this way, it's not zero, it's not ten percent. Like it's it's a pretty big number. So we're yeah. still seeing lots of downloads either to internal teams or to software vendors of the vulnerable version of Log4j. Now, sure, they might have a both another process that says, okay, yeah, we're using this because we have to, but we're going to deploy the mitigations. I, I I don't believe that. Like, and I, if someone tells me that, I'll believe them, but I don't believe it just at the core that they're actually going to do that. So there, there has to be things still shipping with that out there. And let's not forget, like, there's a bunch of like legacy, like routers and legacy just equipment that are just in who knows where on the internet that is still presently vulnerable for log4j. Um, There's still like one of the reasons why we see the scanning is that the attackers are trying to take over each other's infrastructure with log4j that they have too. like they fight over the the infrastructure all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's out there. Yeah, yeah. so it's out there and new stuff is going to get built with it. It's just going, this is going to be one of the things we're going to see like eternal blue from back in the WannaCry days. You know, we still see, eternal blue attempts regularly every single minute of every single day log4j is not nearly as pervasive because it's harder to it's actually harder to do stuff with log4j but the reality is like we're good that this is now going to go in the we're going to see it all the time people are going to keep trying to find it because they know that new stuff is going to be included and old stuff is going to get redeployed mm. yeah i think uh the green report said uh to expect um i think the quote is like headline grabbing log4j attacks uh this year 
Yep. Um, I, 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 will, I, I, will, I will eat our report if we don't see at least one headline grabbing one day this year. <laughs> All right. How many pages is it? Uh, it's 22 pages and okay, you know, 22 it, pages. You can, you yeah. can do that. So, how's, how's I, I, on it? There you go. I, oh yeah, actually there's, there's a whole, there's actually a cookbook for how to actually eat your words. And that's actually <laughs> one of them. Like there's a way to, to prepare it that you can actually eat it and still probably not get sick and actually enjoy yourself. So I'll do that. But, but how do you mean, um, um, if you're, if you're a betting man, you know, what would you put money on seeing as far as log for joy, log for joy, um, exploit that makes the news this year, you know, in what way would that happen? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, so, so yeah, so I, 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 I don't bet. I actually don't bet on anything, but sure. so I, but I so saw like, and that's kind of why I think like I'll eat the report. Um, so there will be at least one, my guess is there'll probably be about three. I absolutely think we're going to see one involving digital currency. Uh, this is going to be a really chaotic roller coaster year for digital currency. The attackers need to have control over the digital currency. They need to be part right. of that ecosystem still. And just being able to like, as ransomware wanes a little, like as they not, as they don't get the same returns they were getting on ransomware, we're going to see lots of ransomware attacks. It's not going down. It's not going to go down this year. But the what they're what they're getting from ransomware is going to go down for lots and lots and lots of reasons. They're still going to want to maintain. So they're going to steal digital currency if they can. So I think we're going to see a log for J attack actually in that space, like in that digital currency space. I won't just say finance in general, but I, but I will specifically say there. Um, I think we're going to... Um, so there, now whether, so the headline, this is where the headline thing, depending on exactly where it hits in healthcare, we may or may not see a headline, um, but we're, we're go so. But my 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 gut call is it will probably happen in the U.S. If if it's a log for J healthcare related attack in the U.S., it will be a headline because there's mandatory reporting requirements. So any country that it hits with mandatory reporting requirements, we will see that. So I'm guaranteed to see a healthcare one. Most likely going to involve ransomware associated with that because it's the unfortunately the easiest healthcare is just the one of the easiest things to actually do that. Um, and I actually think we're going to see some. And so I don't know what part of critical infrastructure that we're going to see. So you know, that could be water, it could be you know gas, it could be electricity, any of those critical infrastructures besides healthcare. Um, we're going to see one there just because they use such legacy equipment and they have no choice but to follow certain strict regimens when they do IT. We may see like a patch come back or a new piece of equipment deployed that didn't have the remediations on it at that kind of hit there. So my guess is we're going to see one in each of those three spaces this year. All right. Um, you know, if you're, you know, uh, IT manager or CIO in charge of um procuring and deploying uh software are you pretty much leaving any vendors that still offer vulnerable you know products with this bug in them so it's really hard to reject a vendor um so have, as someone who was involved in the procurement process in most of my previous non-researcher positions that, that i've been in um, it's very hard to tell a if so someone that owns a business process and then especially one that generates revenue or is involved in like saving lives as the example for healthcare or involved in running critical infrastructure like it would be the other ones it's hard to say yeah you can't use those any it just it just doesn't work you can't do that um the one thing that uh we are like i'm seeing a lot of hope on the horizon for this year uh, so I, w I was involved in doing a lot of the requests for comments and things like that with the CISA's uh, SBOM, the Software Bill of Materials, uh, what work that they were doing in 2022 and, and earlier than that. And this is the year when some of those like beginnings of enforcement actually happen. And the government, like the, so the federal government in the US, and I believe the UK is actually trying to do this at the same time, they're requiring their suppliers to at least give them software bill of materials. So my first advice to all CISOs and procurement managers, and I, and I say that because sometimes a CISO can't do something on their own, but if you if you bring in someone from finance or procurement who has the keys to the kingdom, like they you can't get through any, you can't buy stuff without procurement, right? So if you partner with them and go, hey, if you're not if you don't have an SBOM or software bill of materials that you can give me so I can know what you're running so I know I'm deploying a bad log for J or a broken confluence or you know pick any of the other ones right uh okay well we still have to take the risk of bringing you on but I'll take that 40 percent discount um and I and I'm actually and I mean to any CISO listening like I mean that 40 percent works great I used to do it all the time back in the day um even before S bombs were a thing like if if there was like if someone had like three known bad vulnerabilities in the previous year and someone was up for contract like it would be immediate 40 percent discount like immediate like because it's just yeah. insane to not do that so like use that leverage you have with your purse and like so log4j is one of them but i'm also mean that like go back through even if you just want to limit it to stuff that sissa said and maybe and maybe we said and that's also in your inventory of things that you have that you have to re-up or you might be thinking of buying if there was like a, a big remote code execution vulnerability or even something that was like a major vulnerability that might not have gotten a lot of attention but it made it to those lists 
I mean, this is a great way to start like making your suppliers not treat you like a, like a, a third class per, like a third class entity. Like you're literally doing their work for them. Like they didn't do the software debugging and patching, so you should do that on your own. Great, um, Bob. Uh, that answers all the questions I had. Unless there's anything else that you think we should know um, about the report, and maybe uh, tell us uh, where we can find the report. Sure. Uh, I, I think you hit all the really high points of the report, so I really appreciate you digging into it some with those really good questions. Uh, you can you can go to grainoise.io. There's a big, because of course there's a big link up at the top. Click that thing and you'll get right into the report. You, you can dig it. And all of the research team is available for like any practitioner out there. You just hit us up because like, there's lots of contact info. We will talk at length, as you can heard from me, uh, at, for anything to help you out on anything you want to know with this. Great. All right. Uh, very good. Thank, thanks very much, Bob. I appreciate it. Cool. It's great talking.